up, guys? It's Drew from The Money Is Show, and this week we got a unique guest uh, with a very, very unique backstory that you guys are going to like about money. Uh, Ryan is the uh, CEO of Rocket Lister, and uh, they take real estate photography for all your real estate agents out there, plus a really cool twist on it that I think you guys will like, building a multi-million dollar business out of photography inside of real estate. Before that, and still is, a uh, real estate flipper. So I know a lot of you guys flip houses out there. This guy's done over a thousand flips uh, out of the Phoenix, Arizona market. Uh, so we came up on the show today. I'm asking him a lot of questions about real estate, money, and his new business called Rocket Lister. You guys can follow him and look it up on rocketlister.com. And uh, we'll ask him a lot of questions on the show. Ryan, thanks for coming in from Phoenix, Arizona. Here I am. Yeah, flew in late last night and yeah, yeah. got here early in the morning and super excited to be here today. Uh, when, do you, when do you leave? We fly leave out. tomorrow, so ironically, we got, we got hired to shoot the Utah Jazz Stadium tomorrow. Oh, right on, man. So we're going to go tour that, and then we're out after that. That's crazy, dude. I'm going to the, we're going to miss each other, because I'm going to the Jazz game. Uh, I got floor, uh, uh, floor seats nice. on the Jazz game on Friday, and you'll be there Thursday. Yep. That sucks, dude. Yeah, I'll be there Friday, and they only have, like, they allow like 1,500 people in, uh, fans-wise, yeah. right now, and do this massive uh, stadium. And uh, but I'm pretty pumped because uh, uh, they're playing the Bucks and Giannis is there, so I get to see Giannis play, which I haven't seen him play yet. Are you a basketball fan or no? I am, yeah. So I grew up a Suns fan. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you, well, let me ask you this then: Were you? Because I grew up a Bulls fan out of Chicago. Yeah. I grew up a little part of my childhood was in Chicago from like kindergarten to like sixth grade, which is like basketball central. So I played basketball at the park every day after school. Huge Bulls fan, right? And I remember the uh, Jordan. Barkley, Danny Ainge, Dan Marley. Yep, good old uh, days. See, who the Bulls? That was, of course, Pippen was there. Kevin Johnson. There's some KJ. Other, yeah, that was KJ. before Rodman. Yeah. Uh, and all and uh, Tony Kukoc and Luke Longley. I, I have this. I think like, of course Grant was there I, with them. I had this hatred for the Bulls and the Lakers. Like both those teams <laughs> limited the Suns from ever getting to the championship. Dude, the Suns were uh, so good because they had um, uh, Barkley, Ainge, and Marley. And then they brought in that one guy. No, no, that was the Knicks. I think it was the Knicks. They brought in the Jordan Stopper. I don't know if you remember this story or not. Mm -hmm. I think it was the Knicks in the playoffs when they did that. Who else did the Suns have, though? It was those three. Well, yeah, back in the day, it was the, those are the big ones. So KJ was there. Um, Mar yeah, those are the big names. Um, Hornacek. Hornacek. That's the other yeah. guy I was thinking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He became a coach. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so we were probably both at kids because we are about the same age. Yeah. Uh, so we were probably both at the kids watching the Suns and the Bulls. And then, like during halftime, man, I was out uh, immediately playing basketball in my backyard with a my mom's footstool, so I could try to dunk. Uh, it was like an eight-foot goal we had or something. And um, that's that's funny, man. A Suns fan. Uh, I remember them being such good three-point shooters. Yeah. Uh, Dan Marley and. Uh, Danny Ainge. That's one of my claims to fame. I was about to say, there's I, a story behind here. Yeah, as I bought, we can go into it if you want, but I bought Danny Ainge's house. Now, I didn't buy it from Danny Ainge. Okay. I bought it from the guy that bought it from Danny Ainge that lost it in foreclosure. <laughs> so yeah. you ended up buying uh, Danny Ainge's, which uh, he wanted to be a coach too, didn't he? Yeah, he's with the Boston, no, he's the GM for the Boston Celtics. But he did coach for a little bit, right? Pro I, I thought, I'm pretty sure yeah. he did. Um, he's like one of those like, uh, basketball IQ uh, guys. Very smart. High, high IQ Very basketball, smart, yeah. right? And uh, so you bought Danny Ainge's house that you lived in in Phoenix. Yep. On a short sale. Uh, out of foreclosure, short sale. Not from Danny. Correct. Uh, but the guy who bought it from Danny. Yeah. Uh, back in the day. What, what year did you buy that one? 2013 or 14. And I picked it up for 430000 Okay. I mean, it was like the deal. I had people knocking on my door like, will you take two hundred grand over what you paid for it? Really? Like, it's a, in our world in uh -huh. Phoenix, it's a famous house in Gilbert. Like everybody right. knows it as the Danny Ainge house. Okay. And, and we, it was the guy that left trashed it. Like he ripped crap out of the walls, dragged the dragged the stove and had you know scratched the floors and we had to put money into it to get it back. How uh, how much do you think it's worth now? One point five. One point five. You paid it for four thirty. Yeah. Uh, out, of, out of a short sale. Yeah. One of one of the hundreds and hundreds of deals you did. Have you done any deals in any, any other states? Yeah, so I flipped in Dallas for a while. Okay. And learned that they have foundation issues, which I wasn't used to. <laughs> in Texas, so yeah, we, yeah. we did 10, we made decent money, but I got so tired of like doing this beautiful house. And at the end of it, the buyers would back out because they found out it had foundation issues that we had fixed. Yeah, yeah. But because they had foundation issues, they'd it's back amazing. out. They'd and I just out got over that one thing. tired of, you know, you got to be careful flipping in other states. And I, I, I currently flip in New Mexico. 
Okay, awesome. so as, as an ask, obviously I, I did a ton of fix and flip. And when you say flip, to be clear with all the viewers, you're referring to fix and flip, not Correct. the wholesale transaction side. I don't believe in wholesaling. You don't. Yeah, I, my business partner Jamie Wooley wholesales, and yeah, yeah, a she's lot on of the show. A lot of guys. We run a, a mastermind. A lot of people in our mastermind wholesale. I just hate leaving money on the table. Speaking uh -huh. of money, I just I can't mentally like. I can make more if I flip. It that the cost of emotional cost, right? Mm -hmm. The physical cost of having to flip and deal with all the contractors and the issues. Mm -hmm. The benefit outweighs that cost for me. Not for everybody. It's a funny thing because <clears throat> I, I did very, very few wholesale. Like the wholesales that I did was more because I, I bought it to flip it and then someone came in, made me an offer. I'm like, eh, all right, sure. I'll take it, whatever. It wasn't your business. Because I already had, already had like a ton in the pipeline. I'm like, that's what, fine, whatever, I'll, I'll take the cash. But I never had like a flipping, uh, a wholesaling business. I always did fix and flip. And for the same reason, like I just looked at it and said, yeah, but if I just put a little bit more, not maybe not, and sometimes not a little bit, but you know, whatever it was, 30, 40, 50, 60, 80 grand into it, in, you know, four or five months, I could make like way more money than this, this little fee right now. Um, uniquely enough, a lot of fix and flippers think that way, but then they don't think that way when it comes to the next phase, which is the buy and hold phase. Because no. if they'll buy and hold, it could even be worth more freaking money to them long term okay. with appreciation, depreciation, uh, uh, cash flow, uh, 20 years doing cash out refis on I me. Mean, there's like so many more advantages, right? To, but quick, a lot of fix and flippers will stop right there. Quick math on that. I looked at my rental portfolio. Okay. I have six million dollars of purchase money into them. Now, now some of it was bought with debt and paid off later. Like I played that game right, for a long right. time, <clears throat> but I've got roughly six million into it. They're now worth $17 million. Jeez. And it's just, I bought from 2009 and just kept buying oh it. And I gosh, still buy dude. today, buy and hold. But you're right, it's that value increase that you get over time that it's just free money. I think I just had a, I had a, I did a show a couple of days ago with a guy that does a ton of rental properties, not on this show, it's one of my webinars that I did. And we just we were going through breaking down like all the advantages of rental properties. And even from like a long-term effect where if someone wants to retire with rentals, like you don't have to have 80 of them if you want to go, re like, you know, guys that, or girls who have, they have a good job. They're not trying to become a full-time investor. Sure. If they just picked up whatever the number is, three, four, five, uh, you know, now, and let it be part of their retirement portfolio and, and let someone pay it off over the next 20 years, like it is a complete game changer totally inside, of your, inside of your retirement. If you just had three of them, like yep. a game changer. Because again, over those 20, 30 years, dude, the, the likelihood, there's no guarantee, but the likelihood of that house going up in value is extremely freaking high. There's gonna go up in value. And that's something I learned from my dad indirectly. Uh -huh. He's a home builder and he builds 20 to 30 year communities. Okay. So his communities are thousands of acres that take 20 wow. to 30 years to build. So it doesn't matter where he starts because it, no matter what, 10, 20 years from now, it's gonna be higher than where he started his basis. So it, it's a smart, a lot of home builders get stuck because they do the one to two year play. Uh -huh. And if you time it wrong, you're screwed. Yeah, for sure. You put all your eggs so in that basket, in the market uh, that affects the market uh, uh, inside of real estate, right? Like, is one of the, when people say, what should I do in real estate? My first answer is always uh, first figure out where the market is and then you can figure out what your play is after that. Because so many people just jump into real estate not accounting for what the market is doing, and you could play the wrong game, which is a great game, but you play at the wrong time of yeah. where the market's at and absolutely get murdered uh, inside of real estate. I wanna go back to something you just talked about. You got one of the most unique stories about your childhood and your father uh, uh, type of relationship, if you will. Uh, I want you to, as much as you want to kind of share that story. I know it's obviously a little bit personal there, but break down a little bit of a story as much as you can. Yeah, I know. It, some of it's personal, but I, I've gotten comfortable sharing it. Uh -huh. um, you know, when you have my last name, which in Phoenix is a big deal. I know nationally nobody cares. It, you know, your parts of you think, all right, ego, I want to be this, you know, yeah, I'm part of this empire. But the reality is, is I didn't meet my dad until I was 16. In fact, my name used to be Jones. Okay. And I changed my name to my dad's last name when I was 21. And wow. that's something very few people know. Wow. And, you know, I grew up, my and dad. Uh, your last name now is? Robeson. Robeson. And my, my father and my mom were dating. Okay. And they had me, and there's some type of turmoil. I mean, I don't know all the details. Uh -huh. But she made the decision that she didn't want his money. She didn't want the stress. She was going to raise me on, her, my, on my own. And kind of they both mutually agreed, like, you go your way, I go my way. And, 
you know, okay. like that. So I grew up not knowing my dad was a billionaire, you know, and, and it, I think I found out my mom did a really good job. She was a real estate agent. Okay. So that's how I got to know real estate. Interesting. And she did a really good job as an only child making me feel like we had money for most of our life. But during the crash, I mean, it's feast or famine in that market. And we were in California mm -hmm. and that market has had some really big up and downs during the eighties. I mean, there were two years of our life where we lived in the Econo Lodge and had a toaster oven that we ate out of. Wow. And we ate at Coco's was like our splurge. And she had a friend there that would give us a discount. You yeah, know, yeah. that was like, Coco's was like the splurge. Of the time. <laughs> I love that, their, their pumpkin pie there. And anyway. what, what part of California was it? Escondido. Okay. So we grew up kind of, uh, wealthy is the wrong word. I mean, I don't think she ever made more than 60, 80 grand, but you know, but for part of my life, but then a lot of my life we were very poor. I remember vividly my mom handing me $5 and saying, this is our last $5. And I also remember saving up two or 300 bucks as a eight or nine year old and my mom having to take it for bills. Yeah. And those are like in, I was talking to my, my friend that came with me today. There are certain things that happen in a kid's life that will impact you for the rest of your life. Yeah. And those moments, like I could feel the emotion even telling you today what that was like. And it was, it was very, I don't know the right word, Andrew. Parts of you kind of have some anger, like, wait a second, my dad's a billionaire. We've been living yeah. in a hotel for two years. Like, when ask, you find that out. I was going to ask that, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was a very kind of hard thing to comprehend as a kid. Did your mom remarry? She did um, once while I was little and then got divorced. Okay, so you kind of grew up mainly in a single, totally. a single mom home. Yeah, single mom. I have a lot of compassion towards single moms. <laughs> it's not easy. It's funny, uh, it's so unique, man, because, uh, you know, you've never told me that story before. And when I was uh, a kid growing up, uh, you know, my, my dad went and, and young, like, like seven or something, took me to a bank and had me open up a savings account, you know, and I had my little, like, booklet that he get, you know, that they gave me. And then I worked a paper route and I had a little paper route that, that I did as a kid at, from, like, seven, eight, nine, um, I was in the paper route and I saved my money. Like, like it was like, how much did they pay me? Whatever it was, but I saved my money, saved my money. And I remember one day, I can tell you like in my brain where I was standing. Oh yeah. When my dad had to come to me and ask me to borrow my money yeah. to pay bills. Like I grew up in a poor family. I kind of want to do that to my kids, even if I don't need the money. Yeah. Just so they like have that memory. And I remember like my, my father, who is very, very uh, a leader in my life and, and is my, be my best friend to this day, and uh, man's man, and, and it wasn't because he wasn't working, like just was working as much as he could, as often as he could, but he was in college at the time and then working with a family. And, wow. and, uh, and I remember like the emotional side from him, like coming to like an eight year old son mm -hmm. and like, hey, so look, man, here's what's going on. I need to borrow this. And, and he didn't have to ask me because, you know, I was eight. The savings account was in his name, right? He could have went and just pulled the money out. But I remember he asked me, uh, could he borrow? It was right before school started uh, on one morning, and he asked me, could he borrow the money, and told me why he needed to borrow the money, and then told me he's going to pay me back, and told me he's going to give me interest. Here's how his loans work. That's cool. And uh, sure enough, he did it. I mean, that's how my dad is. Like, if he says it, he'll freaking do it. And But I remember that, like, it's amazing, like, the things that you click um, uh, as a kid. And like you said, that $300 or that you had $200, and you, you got to, your parents are borrowing it for bills. And it's like this thing you don't understand at the time, yeah. uh, but for the rest of your life, you remember it. The thing I was going to ask you was like, you kind of led into it, it was like later in life, you figure out your dad's a actual like billionaire. Sure. Yeah. Uh, massive, massive developer. Um, what was that like going through that when you realized like, holy crap, like, dude, we lived in an Econo Lodge. And meanwhile, my father is this billionaire mm -hmm. and with a stroke of a pen could have fixed the whole problem. Like there has to be like that weird animosity and then love at the same time that you go through. It was, yeah. I, I remember Mr. Terry was my marketing teacher and I, I owe him a lot. I think he's passed away and I owe him a lot of, you know, gratitude for everything he taught me in marketing. And one thing he taught me, he told me a story about him meeting his dad for the first time. And I went after him after class and was crying and uh -huh. telling him about, you know, I've never met my dad. And, and he said, hey, why don't you write him a letter and just say, I'm here. If you ever want to be in my life, here's how to contact me. If not, just know that I'm here and you've done your part. And I sent my dad that letter and I remember working, I was working at Rubio's 
and I don't know if I gave him the Rubio's number. I don't know. How, I, I, to this day, I don't remember how this all connected. But it was in the back, and I got a phone call saying your dad's on the phone. I'm like, my dad? I'm like working at Rubio's, and like he called the main uh, line at Rubio's. Rubio's. Is that a restaurant or? Rubio's is a fish taco place. Okay, fish taco place in yeah. Phoenix. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And great fish tacos. <laughs> still there today? <laughs> yeah, it still is. Still there today. My first job when I was 16. My first job was TCBY, but I wouldn't clean the toilet, so they fired me that night, and I walked across the street and got a job at Rubio's. <laughs> Long story. Um, so I got on the phone, and, I was like, and it was like his secretary, and she's like, hey, he'd, he'd like to meet you for lunch at Rusty Pelican. Would you like to, would you be okay doing that? And, and you know, so I went and met him, and, you know, he, it was around my birthday, so he gave me, like, $600 to gift card to this place that you could buy clothes and you know so emotionally it was like sweet i've got this sugar daddy now uh -huh. like you got that animosity but i'm 16 years old you find out your dad's a billionaire the kids in my high school i lived in a high school that like had really wealthy kids and poor kids mm -hmm. and like kids were driving range rovers and you know the the Horse tahos bus. and all the you know all the nice cars and i remember just thinking like all right i get to be in that club now yeah and it didn't happen uh -huh. Right, and it was like he gave me that money to go buy some nice clothes. I became the nicest dressed kid at school, but you know I had to work through those emotions as a young kid. Like, yeah. hey, your your dad is your dad, and you can now have a relationship with him. But even though he's worth that much, like that relationship's way more important than money. Mm -hmm. And I've just always held on to that. Like, I I don't ask my dad for money. I don't, you know think of him like that. Yeah. I'm just grateful to spend the time that I have since I was 16 to be able to spend with him. We have a great relationship now. I was going to say, so current time, you guys, yeah. good relationship, Super close, do stuff yeah. together, hang out, whatever it is. And he really is an amazing guy. Like it's easy people listening to this to say, you know, what a jackass kind of mm. father to do that to his son, right? And I don't know his reasons. I do know he was adopted and he only met his, he never met his, he didn't met his real dad and he only met his real mom twice. So I think that story kind of helped him you know, mm -hmm. develop a relationship with me, but he really is. I've had, a, I'm a member of, of the Mormon church, he's not. And I've had, I've met with like archbishops, I think, I don't know the name and the very high up people, an apostle from our church and different very high up people like military generals that have all somehow know my dad yeah. and speak very highly of him, of a person, not yeah. money, not a success, just his character. Yeah. And that's just, you know, really shown me a lot about what money is to him, mm -hmm. right? It didn't change him like it has other people, which I've always respected. What, um, go back to the, the mom relationship now. So obviously you raised you through the, through the process. Uh, are you still close with your mom as well? We are, yeah. My, uh, you know, my mom's had her struggles. I, I served a mission in Spain and came home and, you know, she was on drugs and living on the streets, and that was a really hard time in my life. I mean, probably the hardest time I've ever dealt with is I've got this billionaire father and a mom that's homeless. Wow. And, you know, just like the, two the emotions spectrums. of that. Like, the you cannot be further so spectrums hard. apart, right? Yeah. Not, not a dad who's a millionaire, a dad who is a billionaire, yeah. and a mom who is homeless. Um, and you're, at that time, 20 years old, 21 yeah. years old, whatever it may be. Uh, and these are two spectrums that you're living inside of that, at that time. Yeah, so I, I worked two jobs. I skipped a semester of school, worked two jobs, supported her, tried to get her back on her feet. And I, I think that's kept me humble. I mean, I remember being in college and she got back on her feet and she was in, she was in a house now. And I remember like this kid's car had broken down and I, have, I invited him to come stay at our house. And I remember people were like, you don't know this kid. Like he's gonna, I mean, what if he murders you in the middle of the night, whatever. And I remember to this day, my mom like emptying out our shelves and leaving, sending him off to where he was going after we fixed his car with all this food that, like, well, mom, you don't have any food yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. Like, I'm gonna have to work my second job <laughs> to help with you the food. But she's just that personality. Like, I yeah. came home from a mission and she had given away my clothes, my bed, like, to people that needed it. Yeah. And I, you know, I'm, I'm grateful. Not very many children get to grow up seeing both sides of that coin. Sure. Of what it's like to have a billionaire father and, and a homeless mom, right? Or a poor mom. Mm -hmm, homeless sure. is the wrong word. Like, she wasn't homeless for long. But right, right, right you know, just that, the poverty and the wealth, and it, it, it gave me a different perspective on money and happiness. Yeah. Both people, I'm talking about that, go off that point you just made there. Um, one person had more money they could do, they, you know, do, let's say do with, one person had no money. What was the happiness like in each of their lives? Because some people, think, some people, a lot of people think that 
money is happiness and it's, yeah. I don't think it is. What was it like though? So what you're saying is I need to change my word. <laughs> Just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> you know, I, I think not having money causes oftentimes a lot of stress and drama and unhappiness. Yeah. You know, they say you go to a poor country and you find people that don't have money and they're super happy. I agree with that to a certain point. Mm -hmm. But not having money, especially in America. Well, when you, when you um, in those countries, I see you're talking about, a lot of times, that, to me, that has to do with because they have nothing to compare it to. Sure. So there is that true happiness because they, there's nothing to compare it to. Yeah. In America, or when you're around by people and you, you are, every single day of your life, you wake up and you compare it to other stuff, is where it gets confusing at and where I think the road you're going down uh, that you're about to go down is like yeah that's that's it creates unhappiness you may not create happiness but it can create unhappiness well there's these expectations of having a car and a cell phone and then yeah. when your cell phone breaks and you can't afford to fix it I mean yeah. it, society puts us in this rat race in sure. America so I think not having money you know there's obviously joy that you can get out of having family and time and I agree with that, but not having money adds a level of stress, and that taught me that, mm -hmm. that I don't ever want that level of stress again. Yeah. And having money and seeing, being around people like that my father associates with at least, and seeing some of the arrogance that exists there, and the level of stress that these guys bring into their own life with the type of marriages they have, and their, their kids, relationships with their children, it, it brings a whole level of, of unhappiness there too. Yeah. So. You know, I've determined um, that I never want to be a billionaire. Just, I'm not willing, that whole cost and benefit thing, I'm not, not sure. willing to sacrifice what it takes to do it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think money is one of those things that um, um, it, it, it can move the needle so many different directions and, and, and multiple times and change it uh, later in, in life on you as well. And money can, for sure, it's like you go both sides of that coin, which you've experienced probably more than anybody, and on one side of the coin, on the, let's say the, uh, your mom's side, money can cause unhappiness because you're like, well, if I had money, I could uh, have nice clothes, but go further than that. If I had money, I could spend time with my parents. I could, I could travel on vacation, spend time with my family. I could yeah. not have to work this job and spend time with my kids, whatever it is, right? And so the lack of money create, could, can create unhappiness. Mm -hmm. And money can fix those things, and money can fix those things. And I could argue and go on the other side of the coin, when you're wealthy, and now, now that you have the money, it can also cause unhappiness. And you have the money because now you can, you, I find a lot of people, um, a lot of people that are afraid to lose the money. And it creates this like negative energy around them. Like everybody's out to get them. Everybody's, about to, everybody's trying to t take their money from yeah. them. Uh, and it creates this like, they're so unhappy because they're afraid they're going to lose it every time they turn around. What's the market? And you know, they, they freaking live like miserable lives. Uh, and money has caused that side of it. Money is yeah. money's something that, that I feel like you as a person have to control. Uh, and if you don't control money, it will for sure control you. On one side I, of the corner or not, it will control you. I, I related a lot to the ocean as one of the, like water is super scary. Like mm -hmm. the ocean will take you and turn you and waves and it, it has a lot of control over you. Yeah. You could take, the current can just take you out no matter who you are. I've, money is a lot like that. Yeah. I mean, money, you go to have the right things in place or it could take over you. And, and, and that, you know, seeking after money could take over you, right? It could ruin yeah, relationships. Yeah, chasing money. Chasing yeah. money is a dead-end road. It, yeah. it does, you're gonna chase it, I'm just telling you it's a dead-end dead end road. No, normally when people chase money, they'll never, they'll never get it. It's the hot girl in high school. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're chasing something. The more you that, chase her, the more she doesn't like you. A figment of your imagination almost uh, when, when you're chasing money. And not only will you not get it, uh, along the way, you will live a miserable life because you will be so hyper-focused on trying to get it. You'll burn relationships, burn marriages, burn friendships, mm -hmm. uh, because you have this one mind of like money, money, money. And not only will you, you burn relationships, you'll normally never, normally you will never get it by chasing it that way, if you will. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I love the illustration of money and ocean uh, that you just gave there, because I was thinking about it like, um, as a teacher, I love talking about, like I love using illustrations and parallels. And the ocean is one of those things where, like, uh, I am, I have that, like, uh, love uh, and then a massive fear of oceans. Me too. Uh, so uh, I have a place in Florida. I love going on the beach. I love looking at the water. I love sitting on my porch, looking out at the water. I love hearing the ocean hit the uh, shore. Uh, I don't mind getting in the ocean, but I'm, like, super 
cautious yeah. when I get in the water, man. Like super cautious. Um, and maybe part of it is I, I had a, a kid on my little league baseball team die of a on a little baseball trip um, in the ocean because of the, the was it rip rip tie rip tie recurrent, recurrent, recurrent yeah. pulled him under. Totally. And, and he was like 11. And, you know, yeah. didn't know what to do or whatever, and, and drowned. And the and money's like that, man. It it is like so freaking powerful. Uh, if, and like beyond. And then if you ever go like in a helicopter or something over water and you start seeing like how massive that water is and to understand like, dude, you are literally like a speck. Like it, it eats you. And, and there's like, things swimming around in there that have a lot of control over you. Yeah. And, and the amount of power the water has is, is a great illustration of money because like, you just look at it like, yeah, it's a, it's a dollar bill. Behind that is this ocean that is so freaking powerful that you, you don't understand what you're getting in. And that's why I think there has to be that massive amount of respect for money um, or, or it will just devour you. And on the flip side of the coin, I talk about on the ocean, uh, there's also in, in the ocean uh, can provide a ton of fun entertainment in your life. Like people that surf and water ski and all these different things, right? And, and go in the ocean with your friends and family. Like it's a ton of fun and money can be a ton of fun, um, but it can also freaking literally destroy your life. So, uh, it's so powerful. It's not my word, and I know we're not ready to talk about it, but <laughs> you can't use money as like an ocean now. We've already kind of talked yeah, about it. Yeah, I mean, it, so. we kind of used that one up. Uh, <laughs> money is like an ocean. Uh, so you grew up on these two different sides here. Now, let's go into business for a second. Your current business is Rocket Lister. It is. Uh, now, you've done multiple different types of businesses. Uh, flipping, obviously, real estate would be one of the main ones, and yeah. you're still in real estate. Uh, break me down a high level for the viewers. What is Rocket Lister? So it's a one-stop shop for your real estate photography videography, and post sign and lockbox install. So we okay. do everything. We try to provide, we make, try to make real estate agents' life easy. Uh -huh. right? What can we do to help you make your life easy, give you your time back, do the things for you to make you look better? Mm -hmm. So that, I mean, real estate agents right now are shooting stuff with their phone, their iPhones, mm -hmm. trying to take pictures of the properties. Mm -hmm. And that, those images are going on Zillow, they're, yep. going, they're going out to the MLS, and it's a representation of their brand. Yeah. So we, we do professional real estate photography and then handle the annoying stuff like the MLS entry and the putting up the signs and posts that real estate agents really just shouldn't be spending their time doing. You know, it's funny because uh, we talk about real estate photography. Uh, years ago when I was teaching on how to fix and flip and uh, they bring me out to do different uh, of these training programs that they'd want me to teach and I was fixing and flipping maybe like 100 houses a year at the time. And somewhere along that line, um, I learned the importance of photography. Well, I know what it was. I got tired of getting freaking lowball offers on a really, really nice house. Yep. Cause like they, they looked at it as a flip, right? The buyers did. Yep. And I got so frustrated at it that uh, I'm like, dude, I have the nicest house in this freaking area. And you're coming in with a, you know, $10,000 or 8,000, whatever it is. It's like, dude, it's below my asking price. And one of the things that I realized was the importance of photography. And I had a real estate agent. I was paying an agent. Like I wasn't doing fizzbos or anything. And, sure. and I had an agent, but the same thing. It was like this agent was, uh, you know, with all due respect, you know, they were like a, I don't want to say a part-time agent, but, you know, uh, it maybe, and I remember one, I had a couple of them, but I remember one was like a, a mom, uh, several kids. She's going to soccer practice and ba ballet and picking it from school and doing all the stuff that parents have to do, right? Especially sure. moms. And, and, and then kind of in between there, of a soccer practice and getting home for dinner, she would swing by one of my flips, and like you said, pull out her cell phone or a little point and click back in the day, click, 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 take some photos, and then run home and upload it on the MLS. Start on the MLS, yeah. And somewhere along that line, it, it hit me that, dude, this is the first thing that my potential customer is going to see of my uh, product. This is my product, right? The first thing they're gonna see is these photos. And, and they're going to judge you based on the 100%. quality. 100%. And I, yeah. I, I begin to sit down and think about, well, how, what does my customer do? Like, let me think about how a customer works of, of mine that, that's trying to buy a potential house for me. Yeah. And it was always the process of, well, how does it work? Well, most buyers nowadays uh, don't even go hire a, a buyer's agent. Most of the time they're going on online first. Yeah. They're going on Zillow. They're going on Redfin. They're searching themselves, right? And they're typing in their criteria. And if they're in my market, my area, and it hits my criteria, my house will pop up. And then they're, and, and they're scrolling through that click, click, click. And in that moment, they're literally saying yes or no. Like at that moment right there. 
Totally. That's where they're saying. They're swiping left or right, right? Yeah, it's like a dating app for them, <laughs> right? And um, in, in that very moment, based off of the photos, they're saying, I want to go see this property or I want nothing to do with this house. And I realized, like, dude, I, I just spent whatever it was, $50,000 on this rehab, making this house as nice as I could possibly make it so that when the buyers came by, they were like, oh, I want this house. But if they never came by my house, I can't yep. make them, give them to buy it. Oh. And I spent 50 grand on a rehab and then had a, a real estate agent take, a, take photos with their point and click camera who has no understanding of photography. Like, totally. that's not what their background is in. Their background is being a real estate agent, right? No. And I went and hired a professional photographer in my local market and came up with a deal with them. Like, we didn't have a rocket lister, right? It was sure. like, but I was smart enough to realize uh, I'm going to have to go hire someone. And I hired a real estate, I mean, a, a photographer that got all these like cool angles, cool positions, yep. uh, the right lighting, right time of day. They know how to tell a story with the photos. Yes, yeah. all this stuff. And then I just dropped it off to the agent. And it was one of the things I did that made a drastic difference okay. in my listings was my photos. Absolutely. And I think so many agents are missing that and they're thinking, uh, uh, you know, either a, maybe, it's a, maybe you know this, is it an issue of maybe they don't want to spend the money or, or, or either B, they don't see the value in the photography, videography of a, of a listing right now? Which one is it? Or is it a mixture of both? You know, I think part of the problem with the industry is there's a lot of mom and pops. Uh -huh. And of, of real estate agents? Real estate photography. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, photography. Yeah, okay. the real okay. estate photography business is generally right. mom and pops. It's yeah. changed now, there's, there's more of them. Tons of mom and pops and it's these side photographers. And real estate agents, oftentimes when they try it out, they have a bad experience with the process because a mom and pop photographer, they often like, they're a wedding photographer full-time mm -hmm. and a real estate photographer part-time. Mm -hmm. So they just don't have a great experience with it. Um, I, most real estate agents, especially, I mean, Instagram's really helped us, right? Mm -hmm. Instagram's all about photography, yep, and beautiful yep. photography, and filter experiences. And so it, it's helping real estate agents realize how important nice photography is. Mm -hmm. So that's a huge advantage for us. And the fact that we're able to help agents scale, mm -hmm. you know, like if you, if you call me at 4 p.m. on a Wednesday, I am shooting guaranteed on a Thursday like next day. And mm -hmm. then I'm guaranteeing the photos back at Friday at 9 a.m. Mm -hmm. And those little details are, you know, it's our job as Rocket Lister to get that word out there that you can use a mom and pop photographer, but you might, you'll get good photos. It's just gonna take you a week to get them. Yeah, yeah. Right, so we're, it, I think that's part of the problem is they haven't been educated. Yeah, I mean, I'm just going back to when I did it and, and I remember I had to uh, go through an entire process even with my photographer that I hired and I, have, I don't know exactly what you charge. I was paying $400 for this photographer to come into my house. And we, I kind of went through it and, and said, okay, I want um, a, these certain photos. Like I want, I need whatever it was. I need a photo of the house and the front of the house. I need the back of the house. I need these bathrooms. I need, uh, you know, highlight this, uh, this of the kitchen, whatever it was. I had to create the system yeah. for my photographer because he was not a real estate photographer. He was just yeah. a photographer, a great photographer. But sure. like you said, there's a difference between taking photos of a, um, people and then totally. uh, I think they call it landscape in photography where it's just like a standstill. Yeah. Architecture, landscape, all kinds of different photography out there, yeah. And you're all right, man. I forget about that. I had to go and sit down and spend hours and hours. And, and, and one of my advantages was I had so many houses that we were flipping. It's like, okay, here's six houses. Yeah. Let's go play with these and figure out what we need. And I remember I had to go back and it's like, how many photos will the MLS allow me to have yeah. uh, in, my, in my market? And then I remember we created these things called like, and I'm sure you guys do this, like a, I call them magazine ready photos, where they kind of not, not um, uh, change the structure of the house or anything or walls, but we get rid of like uh, reflections or shadows or yeah, we do all that. Yeah, all that like That's magazine. So, uh, and the big thing is stuff. like window pools. Yeah. And, yeah, we do all that really cool editing. Yeah, we'll, yeah. We'll, we'll put you know, the sports game on the TV and fire in the fireplace mm -hmm, and make mm -hmm. the grass green and a blue sky guarantee of his clouds. Yeah, yeah. So all that's tricks, all of, the, that stuff. tricks of the trade. And you know, there's, there's little how to's that I, you know, we can go into that probably aren't worth it. But really the point is, is our main goal is to save the real estate agent time. Yeah. How can we save you time? And I think it's brilliant what you added on to it with the post and the signage and the lockbox. What was the angle there? The angle is, is it's frustrating as an agent. When I was a customer of Rocket Lister and Lister Sister in these different photography companies for 10 years while I was flipping. Mm -hmm. And I hated having to go to two or three different places to solve one need. Mm -hmm. 
So it, the angle is is to, it, I'll tell you what, we just moved warehouses from two big warehouses into one. It is a pain in the butt to have to store all of your signs and log boxes for these agents. Yeah. We got to store them, we got to track them and keep track of them and have a barcode right. system and yeah. it's a lot of work. And paint the post when they get damaged and just deal with all that. But it's such a value add to our customers to have one place to order it. And I mean, think of the mess as a real estate agent, it's in the weeds for two seconds. You order posts and sign from this company, then you order photography from this company, the photographer shows up and the house really isn't ready because the contractor isn't finished like he says going to or whatever yeah. happens, the seller didn't have stuff ready. Well now you're having a, the, the post guy is already scheduled to come out tomorrow. You have to manage two or three different companies to deal with this one scheduling issue. So we solved that issue by having a one-stop shop for mm. realtors where it's just one phone call, one email, and we'll reschedule and deal with everything. Uh, so understanding what Rocket Lister does, rocketlister.com is a website. If they are, are an agent, want to know more about it, they can go to rocketlister.com uh, to get more information about it. I want to stay on business, but let's get back up a little bit off of maybe exactly Rocket Lister, what it does. Sure. I want to talk about from your perspective about business. Yeah. Here you are a flipper, right? Mm -hmm. you're, you're doing hundreds of houses, successful in the flipping industry. You have rental properties. At what point does your brain say, you know what I should do? I should mm -hmm. go buy this other company yeah. and go build a nationwide, which is where you're headed with this, with Rocket Lister. Yeah. Like what, what was the, from your perspective in business, what was, what was your opportunity or your aha moment? I married the right woman. Really? Honestly. Interesting. So I, you know, talking about fear, fear of money and that, mm -hmm. you know, just to kind of, if we don't mind, we rewind a yeah. little bit back to my past. So I was lucky enough to get a job with a hard money lender. I okay. was an accountant first, got a job with a hard money lender, and mm -hmm. that was my, my breakthrough into the real estate industry. And my mentor at the time has said, you need to learn how to value real estate. If you can uh -huh. learn how to value things. So I became an underwriter, and I was underwriting deals from 07 to 09, which was a very weird time to underwrite deals, because yep. I underwrite them up, and then I had to underwrite That's them right. as they were going down. That's right on the both sides. Yeah, so I got to see both sides of that coin during those few years. And I remember, it, sitting in my, I just got back from vacation and I remember that hearing the door ding and the guy walks in and the owner of the hard money lending company walks out and the guy hands him a pink piece of paper and the owner's head just goes like this. And he got a cease and desist letter from the Department of Financial Institutions saying, we're investigating you for wow. practices. To his defense, six months later through a lawsuit, they cleared his name and he was fine. Uh -huh. But I mean, I stayed off for two weeks, but I didn't have a job. Yeah. Like you got to just keep paying me to not lend money, you know, right. and like, you know, he wasn't doing anything wrong or unethical, but they, at the time during 2009, they oh, were yeah. looking for targets. Oh yeah, for sure. And going Other after any companies, lenders, yeah. mortgage offices, they're looking, they were, I on felt, I felt bad for the guy. I had got great experience there. I had saved $40,000 in my bank account and I remember I spent two weeks. I was working out every day. I traveled a little bit. I slept in. And I just got super bored. I, I thought I was rich. Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, I was spending like 1500 a month to live and I had roommates that were paying my mortgage or whatever, right? And I was like, man, I'm super wealthy. And I got bored and I, I uh, wanted to get into real estate again. And this is like, I knew the crash had happened at this point, mm -hmm. right? And I, I met up with a friend that I had met on the softball field and he had just lost everything. Okay. He had hit a million net worth and then lost everything. And it was getting back and he was getting into the loan modifications. That was the buzzword yeah, loan back mods. then. Oh yeah. The big buzzwords. Short sale, loan mods, REOs. And to this day, I'm still grateful that I partnered with him. We just said, partner, let's do this loan mod thing. And within two weeks, I realized we're collecting $3,000 up front from people. And I don't know if these are ever going to go through. And luckily, we switched to short sales. Okay. Because the loan mod people crash and burned. Yeah. And the long story we don't need to go into, but they really crashed and burned. That business wasn't a good business model. And we just started flipping short sales. In 2009, we did our first deal. I spent, we bought a condo for 80 grand. Uh -huh. I put all of my $40,000 into that one deal. <laughs> and it, it, you gotta remember the mentality back then. We were scared of banks going under and banks were going under left and right. Oh, we pulled yeah. all of our cash out of our banks and we had a vault in our, in our oh, wow. office and we had all our cash in it. And we literally bought our first house with cash. Wow. Like we showed really up with a title cash. company. The title company's like, you can't pay cash. Like go, <laughs> like, we had like stacks of money. There's a picture out there somewhere with me with stacks of money out there. 
And we were just scared the bank was going to take all our money. We were stupid and young. We didn't know. Yeah. We had FDIC insurance. We just didn't know. So we had all of our cash in this. And anyway, we had all our rentals paying in cash in the future. Yada, yada, yada. <laughs> It was, it was a mess. So we did our first flip, and then from there, we did like 30 our first year, 50 our second year, and then just started doing hundreds a year after that. And going back to my wife, I would gotten married during that time in 2000. Oh, shit. I hope my wife's not watching this. Is it 2000? We've been married for 10 years, so 2011. 11, yeah. Yep, 11, there you go. And she, in about 2017, she got fed up with... One of my mentors told me, always leave more on the table than you take. Okay. And I just had that spirit in that partnership. Mm -hmm. It never bothered me that I worked harder, that I drove harder, that I was the driver, I was the one with the money relationships that brought helped raise the money. It just never bothered me like it bo started bothering my wife. Mm -hmm. He would leave the month of July every year and take his family on vacation. For a month. And she would always say, how come we never get to leave for a month? Like, well, who's gonna run the business if I leave, you know? It was just that feeling, and I, I didn't care. I didn't mm -hmm. mind working. And she, I started to have some other ideas of businesses I wanted to do. And what's hard about a partnership with flipping is all your money is in assets. Right. So it's like, if I wanted to pull money out to do another business, he had to pull money out, and it just wasn't fair to the business. So I was very married and loyal to that idea. And she just said, all right, I've had enough. It's time for you to break up and go on your own. And that was scary as crap. I mean, when you have a business partner and he's kind of your crutch, mm -hmm. it's almost like there's somebody at your level that you can rely on if you're having a bad day. Yeah. And being on your own, like, you, you got to show up every day. You don't have anyone else that can help you. And she convinced me in 2017, and something triggered, like, he did something that I didn't like, and I just blurted it out. I'm like, I think it's time for us to be done being partners. Mm. And it just came out. Yeah. And he was like, yeah, I think so, too. And in... I, I talked to him about a year later, and we're still friends. We're still business partners in a lot of rentals that we have. Uh -huh. And it was like, hey, are you more successful on your own? Yeah, yeah, so am I. Like, we both, we needed each other at the beginning, mm -hmm. and we we're most successful. So I'm grateful for my wife for doing that. You asked me how I got into Rocket Lister. I'm going to get there, so I apologize. And it's your, your wife was pushing you. Pushing me. With her now, yeah? So 2018, I started all over flipping. And we took, we both, my old business partner and I, we agreed for three months we won't market our, for ourselves. Okay. We're going to be honest to each other and try to wrap up our operations and spend all of our time wrapping up. So in January of 18, I mean, I literally, like, I had zero leads coming in. And I thought, man, I've been grinding for nine, eight years, you know, eight, nine years. I don't want to grind anymore. What's the cheapest marketing, not cheapest, excuse me. What's the best marketing method to get the least amount of leads with the highest value lead, like the most motivated seller out there? Mm -hmm. And at the time, I had the money. I just I hadn't been on an acquisition appointment in five years because that's what he did. Yeah, I, mean, I didn't. I knew how to market, but I didn't know how to go on acquisition appointments. And I started doing PPC, and okay. I spent eighteen grand a month in my market. And I was I just said I want to be number one. I don't care what it cost. And I got like thirty leads a month in, and I just started doing two or three deals from those thirty leads. I highly qualified them, and I just I was tired of the high transaction volume. Mm -hmm. And my model in eighteen was buy super deep and not have a big team and just live a good life. And I did really well in 18. I did 600 grand in net income in 18. And then in 19, I had this crazy idea to travel 120 days. Okay, for the year. Which I'm glad I didn't decide to do that in 2020. <laughs> yeah. and, and my wife somehow got on board and we had young children and we did Egypt and Italy and uh, I did Portugal. I did the World Cup mm -hmm. and Wimbledon in the same trip. Like I just did really cool stuff during that, that year, and I, the way I did it is I hired a kick-ass acquisition guy that understood how to manage construction, and he ran it, and I made more money that year than any year I ever have in flipping, mm -hmm. being out of the business. And I realized, it, I got tired, Andrew. I don't know if you ever dealt with this. You probably were smarter than I was. I doubt that. I got tired of being really wealthy on paper. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I exactly never had more than $100,000 in my in bank, the account. bank account. Ever. But you had a lot of houses. A lot of, I had rentals yeah, and yeah. flips going on. Yeah, like yeah. I, I was just, every time I had money in, there was Boom, another deal to one, buy. Next one, next deal, next deal. Or if I had money, I'm paying off debt because yeah. I'm getting paid 10, 11% on my hard money and I didn't want to keep paying that. And I just got like, I never felt wealthy. Yeah. Ever. Which is good. Don't get me wrong to like be wealthy but not feel wealthy. But there's a difference between cash in the bank, liquid wealth, and asset wealth. There is a freaking difference. 
And real estate is one of those that uniquely, especially the flipping world, creates low cash, liquid, and high paper wealth. Yeah. So it's cool that my rentals are worth 17 million, but the market could crash, so they could be worth 6 million again, mm -hmm. right? Like, it's cool to know that, but I, I really never had cash. Yeah. And I got tired of that, and I, you know, Rocket Lister is a business that's a cash generating business, right? It's not a, I'm not having to reinvest into new assets like I did in flipping. Yeah. So that's why I made the transition. One yeah, the that makes total, total sense because, I, you know, we kind of had the same background of like, uh, you know, after that crash, exploding into fix and flip. And uh, that is literally what happened to me. I was, I got to the point where it's just like, gosh, it was like, I had a lot of money. I knew I had a lot of money. But if you asked me to go get it for you, I couldn't go get it for you. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it's like uh, there was so much money coming in and out of my checking accounts, just like insane amounts. Because okay. every time I would close the house and get $183,000, like four days later, poof, it was going back out to three more uh, houses or whatever it was, right? Um, and it, was, it got to the point where I was very, very, and then you try to like give yourself a paycheck and you're paying yourself this, but it's like, yeah, I'm just living off of this though. Uh, I have a paycheck I'm living off of, but yeah. gosh, all my money is like, and you don't ever f feel wealthy. Yeah. Y you know what I mean? Um, it's very, very unique when you get into, into, that, into that flipping business. Cause me and you were both running a business in flipping. It wasn't yeah. that we were just flipping houses. Sure. We were running a, a full operation of, yeah. of a business inside of flipping. But it does have that uh, feeling of exactly what you're talking about versus running a business that is a cash producing, income producing, non asset based uh, type of business. Um, it's a very, very unique uh, business uh, when you get into one of those where it's like, wow, huh, every month I have uh, more money and, and more, more cash. Next in the month bank. I have more cash and next month I have more cash. And what happened to me, I don't know if this is what you did or not, but like as I got more and more, you know, kind of built up the cash, then it became a thing of like, well, Hmm, where should I put this cash now? Because yeah. like I got, I went to the other extreme where like uh, I wanted certain goals. Like I wanted to get my bank account with two commas. Like that was yeah. like a big thing for me when I first did it. Sure. Like of not net worth of like liquid cash. cash. Yeah. And then it was like eventually kind of rolled back around. Was like yeah, but you're an investor, dude. Like you got to put it. You need to put it somewhere um, versus just sitting on it, if you will. I don't know exactly the feeling that you had there. So you, your wife is the one to kind of push you out into. Hey, you should go. Uh, split this partnership up. And uniquely enough, I was going to ask you about partnerships. A lot of people on the, uh, out there watching may mm, be thinking about partnerships. And I think I see a lot of times when newbies in business and real estate want to get into a business and want to get into real estate. And their immediate, immediate thought is almost like, oh, I should go partner up with this person over here. Oh, this guy's a contractor. I'm going to partner with this yeah. contract, whatever it is, right? Yeah. Um, and most of the time, those partnerships are absolutely disasters. Like, and I've been in them before. I'm not even saying that it was my, my fault, his fault. I'm just saying I've been in disaster once. Um, yours turned out really, really good uh, in your partnership. Yeah, yeah. How, however, uh, I want to get into why you think it turned out good. And I love the take with you had of like, on every relationship, uh, you just try to leave more on the table. Yeah. Um, than, than the other person there. Then you take and that, that would be true in a husband-wife relationship. That's true in a, a father-son, uh, father-daughter relationship, yep. and a business partnership relationship. If you're always the one leaving more on the table, and uh, your relationships will probably turn out way, way better sure. over time, yeah. if you can, you can get over leaving on the table there. Yeah. Why do you think your partnership, partnership turned out good, though? Loyalty, for one. Mm -hmm. I mean, my wife hated this, but she would call me for advice. She likes buying rentals for our personal stuff, which mm -hmm. I appreciate about her. That's cool. And she would call me and ask me for advice during the day. And I was so loyal to our partnership. I would tell her, I feel like I'm cheating on my business partner, talking to you about real estate, helping you real estate for my personal self. Wow. That's I mean, deep I, loyalty. I, I was that loyal. Yeah. And, and we had nothing on paper. He had houses in his name, I had houses in my name. From a like one of us dying perspective, horrible <laughs> idea. Screwed, yeah. Horrible idea. But we just had that level of trust and loyalty that mm. just like any relationship, I mean, that it was like a huge foundation. And we didn't always get along and we didn't always agree. Uh -huh. But just that level of being willing to talk things out and trust each other and nobody was, we both had the same goal in mind. And in all honesty, Andrew, we set our goals around our family. Like, all right, this year, let's try to get our cars paid off. This year, let's really work on buying a house free and clear. 
and so that we could have a better foundation for our family, right? Mm -hmm. So this was you and your business and my business partner. partner. Okay. We were aligned in our goals. Gotcha. We weren't both trying to, you know, buy yachts and planes and like mm -hmm. just do things that were, you know, we didn't have one person trying to grow here and one person here. Mm. And, and our partnership did get to the point where his kids were at an age where he wanted to spend more time with them and I was still driving. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think in any partnership, it's good if you need it, but all partnerships are going to, all business partnerships are going to end at some point for the most part. Mm -hmm. And structuring those in a way, knowing, talking about what the end could look like up front. And when we get a certain goal, it would be a good time to, to part ways is important because when one person is becomes the crutch and the other one becomes the driver, expectations go out the window and different expectations and hard feelings and those are hard. Let me say this, uh, a lot of times partnerships struggle with uh, communication mm -hmm. uh, because like in a marriage, you can get along as good as you want to, you can be best friends. There comes a point where you're going to argue, you're going to disagree on something, you're going to yeah. not see eye to eye. Sure. Um, a lot of times, and I'll talk just personal side here, a lot of times my personality is almost like uh, I'll just eat it, the, the whatever's going on that I don't like, I'm like, eh, whatever, it's, 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 it's not worth the battle. <laughs> it's not worth the fight, it's not worth the argument. I'm not, I'm, I'm not talking about in a personal relationship, I'm talking about in a partnership where I'm like, eh, I don't want to deal with that crap right now, like, yeah. whatever, dude. Um, but then over time, without the other partner knowing, I've built up, you know, 40 months now of, oh, whatever, oh, whatever, let it go, whatever. And to all the point where it's like, the tank is full and I have nowhere else to go. Sure. And that's when I mean where it, the explosions happen. How do, I mean, you kept your partnership together for... Almost 10 it? years. Almost 10 years. Eight, nine years, yeah. Uh, obviously, you guys disagreed. How did you, any tips on how to communicate and break those uh, barriers there? Luckily, he was pretty humble. Okay. So, <laughs> as long as one partner is humble. It's true, yeah. You know, I, I would get more frustrated with him at certain times. It would just build up and I'd have to let it out. And he was a great listener. And he admitted the things that he didn't do wrong. And then it helped me humble myself because I would come off maybe a little too aggressive. Mm. And, and these are all things that I've gotten way better at. But at the beginning, I sucked at. Like, I, I prided myself on winning every negotiation yeah. to the point where I'd piss people off. Sure. Like, my painter would get tired of working with me because I was constantly trying to grind him. And it was like a, a pride thing, right? Mm -hmm. and I, so I've learned a lot of lessons there. Um, he, he taught me a lot there in the humility of things and just he didn't let stress because he had lost everything right mm -hmm. before we started mm -hmm. and gone through that depression and stress of losing everything. You know, when we dealt with failures, I learned a lot from him on rolling with the punches and just realizing like, it's not that big of a deal. Yeah. Like tomorrow the sun's going to rise again. I still have a wife. I still have a family. I still have my needs met. Like it's okay. I want to ask you uh, one more question here, and then we get the money is. Uh, this is a unique one. I've been wanting to ask this question for maybe uh, maybe the last two months of the money is show. Okay. And I just haven't asked it yet. And and I'm on a, I'm stealing this from Elon Musk. Um, oh. I was reading some articles on Elon, and uh, some of the, it was a magazine was asking him some of the questions. Uh, uh, they asked him how he does interviews. That's what it was. I was like, oh, I'm going to read this article because I interview people. And it asked them what was his favorite interview question that he inter when he interviews with people that that he he likes to ask them to find out stuff. So I'm going to ask it to you. Okay. I think, but this is the first time I've ever asked this question. And I, and if it goes good, I, I think I'm going to make it one of my uh, uh, I ask every time on the show. Uh, Elon loves to ask people when he's talking to them what is the what is the most the biggest most difficult problem in business that you personally have ever solved. I know it's a it's a unique one. Yeah. For sure. Let me just break the ice for a second. I could have sworn you were gonna Joe Rogan me and break out some marijuana. So the marijuana. Gonna, <laughs> I thought for sure you were gonna pull that out right now. That's where this was <laughs> going. Like, I cannot. You're do an this. Elon Musk Joe Rogan yeah, me right yeah, now. No, but, no, no. So you know, honestly, I I don't have a specific example other than the people. Okay. Is solving the people issue. When I hired that kick out I mean I paid him 120 grand a year to be my acquisition manager uh -huh. that's way more than most people out there are paying acquisition pe people and solving the people issue I think has been my biggest leverage so like the cabinet business I own the business I own in New Mexico I brought in these young entrepreneurs that were motivated invested in them and found a players that needed money and advice okay so committing myself 
do only associate my people with myself with A players and train up the Bs and if they're not trainable, get rid of them, mm -hmm. in my opinion, is the biggest contributor to my success. So the so your answer, if I understand it right, because he has a follow-up to this one. Uh -oh. I think you kind of answered it, but um, his, his two questions he asked was, number one, what's the biggest problem that you solved in your business? And for you, I think the answer is understanding people, uh, the people side of the business. And his follow-up question is, what did you do to solve that problem? And you were kind of giving an example there of your acquisition manager and then it, managing your bees up, if you will. Go through that little, little bit of process. Go a little bit deeper there. Look, I, I think there's this saying out there, right person in the right seat. It's very okay. famous. Everybody yeah, talks yeah, yeah. about it. There's all kinds of personality tests. I've always added on to that, the right person in the right seat for the right amount of money. Interesting, man. And so freaking true. And I, you know, uh, I'll just give an example without naming names. But, you know, I, in a negotiation, if I think you're an A player uh -huh. and I'm looking to hire you and you tell me, I always ask, what do you think you're worth yeah. for this job? What Easy do you think this one. position's worth? And what are you worth? Mm -hmm. And I mean, recently, you know, somebody said, hey, I'm worth probably 120 to 125. Okay, I'll give you 150. And I, I always give them more than they think Interesting, they're worth. Interesting, yeah. Every time. Interesting. And if you're an A player, I'm willing to do that. Yeah. And that has, that extra 20, 25 grand or five grand on 40 grand, whatever it is, it just, in my opinion, helps them see, wait a second, he thinks I'm worth more than I think I'm worth. Mm, he believes in me. Yeah, and me. I'm going to live up to that. So well, I, that's the truth there, man. I pay my A players really well. I try to train up my Bs. If not, I get rid of them. And my C players, I, uh, our good friend Eddie Wilson says, yeah. just don't pay attention to your C players. I truly think you just need to get rid of your C players. <laughs> and if you're struggling out there getting ahead, I mean, your very first hire, if you're looking to hire, it better dang well be an A player. Mm -hmm. You bring a C player on day one, they're it's just going to pull you down. It's just frustration. Yeah. If I'm having to worry about you and the tasks you're getting done or not getting done, you got time for that crap. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I think that right person, right seat, but the paying them the right amount Boy, is super important. That is like, yeah, you, I mean, you could write a whole book on that concept right there because the, the concept of, um, you know, the right person, getting the right people, the, the, the one that I always use that when I teach stuff is like, uh, it's important to get the right people on the bus. Yeah. Your, your, your vision, you're going somewhere, you got your bus, and you got to get the right people on the bus to make this thing go. Super important to get the right people on the bus, but it's also equally important to get them in the right seat. Because yeah. you get a, uh, an A player, but you put them in the wrong arena. Yeah. Um, even though he's an A player or she's an A player, they'll struggle and not be... They'll perform for a little bit, but they'll go back to average. Yeah, it, it is, falls apart. But this is so freaking true of getting the right person on the bus, getting the right person in the right seat, and then paying them the right amount. Yeah. Um, dude, that is such good freaking knowledge. I'm glad I asked that question now, man. Well, I'm I, mean, little, like a, I was a little nervous a great, to answer it. That's so. a great actual yeah. point. Like I think people miss, myself included, like when I was, you know, uh, growing is like, you just kind of miss that point of paying. Um, you're so focused on like, I got to hire an A player. I got to get an A player. I got to get this person in the job and paying the right amount of, should be part three of that whole phrase, man. Well, you go 120 and then you're like, if I can get him at 110 and tell him that he'll get more if he performs, yeah. that people don't respond well to that. Well, I think some, uh, very, very few will. Yeah. And, and normally those are the hard ones to hire because they'd actually don't want to be hired yeah. because uh, it's, it was almost like guys like me when, when a long time ago when I got a job and uh, this is uh, 20 years ago and they, the guy kind of asked me the question like, what do you think you're worth? And I was like, how about, I remember talking to him like, hey, how about you just give me like this really, really low base yeah. and then let me go produce and pay me commissions off of what I produce for you. And that's because you believe in yourself so much. Yeah, it was like an opposite, yeah. right? People need that belief. They want it, someone that will believe in them. And I love it because when you pay them, the question you ask is brilliant, which is what do you think you're worth? And then to pay them extra with your reasoning behind it of, oh, well, I'm going to pay you this actually. Uh, you give them that like burst of like, man, I got to produce. I want to produce. Not, yeah. not that I have to, but I want to. Uh, and, and he it establishes that so Brilliant, all man. all relationships in sales it's all building relationships of trust mm -hmm. and it just establishes that that relationship of trust with that employee day one i'm, a, I'm gonna uh, i'm running out of time but i want to throw one more question at you from a business standpoint okay. that i've never asked anybody either and i'm thinking man, this could be good for the show here uh one more uh question here if you were starting from um starting i don't say starting over right now but just tomorrow and you were gonna go, you, you needed to go uh, start, open, or even buy a business. What business, minus something that you, were, you may be in the process of doing, don't create competition mm -hmm. for yourself, but 
what business would you lean on starting or opening right now in today's so, world? So interesting. So Jamie Wooley, who yeah. we're both friends with, mm -hmm. called me about a friend of hers mm -hmm. who is in that struggle right now. Like his business is currently struggling. He's grinded. He's done really well, but he's tired of it and he wants to do a new business. And she called me with that exact question. What and would you start? Not an easy answer. No, no. I mean, I look, I would understand what your strengths are and what you're passionate about. I invested in Rocket Lister not because it's a cash flow business, it's because my days at Rubio's and my first job, I loved selling fish tacos. I'd always joke with people, as soon as I make a million dollars, I'm going back to Rubio's. Mm -hmm. That didn't happen. <laughs> but I just enjoy, people would leave me, it's, you come up to the counter and order, people would leave me tips on the table, I was so good. Mm -hmm. Like it's not like at McDonald's, you never leave a tip on the table. Yeah, yeah. I had such good, I loved customer service and customer experiences and Rocket Lister gives me, flipping never does that. You no. never meet the end buyer. Mm. You assume you would have that interaction, you but you don't. I never got that emotional high of serving somebody. Yeah, true. So I would find something you're passionate about like that and don't do it just for the money. Like mm -hmm. if you're chasing the money, chase the passion. And then, you know, a specific industry wise, that's a really hard one. I, I really think, which leads into my word, we can get into later, I really think you could be successful in anything you do. It, taking a mom and pop business and making it a national brand, like it, mm -hmm. anything. I mean, I think a lot of companies have proven that to us, right? The coffee, Starbucks, right? I mean, it's a yeah. great example. There's so many companies that are like, Top Golf, I love that example. Like mm -hmm. freaking driving ranges, never made money yeah they just never they did were, they weren't they were a money maker lost. yeah yeah and top golf figured out how to turn that into a sexy Massive fun business money maker yeah. uh, top golf is like so crazy from a real estate perspective i remember sitting with my mentor and him saying you know find a business in real estate where the institutional money isn't already chasing it mm -hmm. and that's hard because they just entered into the residential <laughs> and there's yeah, still did. room in residential but like they're not a mobile home parks yet they're not in some of the, they kind of are, but you know what I mean, not on a national scale. Apartments, those get eaten up by those, those yeah. guys really fast. So it's find somewhere where you can still get into that mom and pop industry and take it national. Yeah, I love it, man. It's very, very true when you want to go start a business. It's probably the most, minus me trying to pull a exact uh, business out of you right now. Um, I think that the truth lies in what you're saying, which is find out what you're passionate about and uh, if you go down that road, um, you'll be surprised what you find down that road of your passion. And no matter what, you'll be happy while you're doing it. All right, I gotta, I gotta wrap up the show. Okay. Uh, I wanna talk about uh, your answer here. All right. Uh, money is, so uh, you know what to do here. You'll flip the answer here and then uh, sign it between these two right here, pretty big right here. And then uh, when you give the sign back, don't tell me what the word is yet. And at the end of it, uh, show, give that back to me, and then you'll go over what, what it means Kay. to you. Let's we'll do, do a big reveal here with you. This is a big moment. <laughs> I had some really good ones in mind. And I love people that take the time to like, I've had, I've had people go by the domains after they've said, after they came up with the word. Mine's pretty simple. All right, I know you, you joked with somebody that people spell these things wrong, so now I'm a little <laughs> nervous. If that's spelled wrong, we can do it again. We'll right? do it again. Oh. I think it's spelled wrong. Is it? I think. Now I'm, now I'm second guessing myself well, here. Let's just go with okay. it. Okay. Uh, the answer is money is a choice. Money is a choice. I'm going to have to get them to. I, I'm giving me the okay that we're spelled right. Okay. Okay. Because now, like, when you said <laughs> that I second guess, and it's such an easy word to it spell. It is. And it I'm is, like, yeah. no, that's off. That's got to be off. All right, so money is a choice. All right, break it down for me. What does it mean? And a lot of this comes from my past that, you know, I, it's so hard for me when I meet people that complain about, well, you have money because. Mm. And I think money is a choice whether you have money or not. Now, there's limits to all of these words on the wall. Yeah, yeah, sure. There's rules where like, yeah, not everybody could be a trillionaire. Mm -hmm. right? So I, I, I agree with that. Ignoring that for a second, I think the choices we make on a daily basis define how much money we have or don't have. Mm -hmm. And it's so frustrating to me, me to find, you know, I mentor some kids and then I like watch them on Instagram, I watch them on Facebook Lives and what they really do day to day, like they're not doing things to develop the skills they need to make money, mm -hmm. right? So I, I think that's where that word comes from for me is I made choices and sacrifice to get to where I am today. 
and the people that see me and the you know coming to work in the sandals you know having traveling 120 days a year they don't see the choices i made to get to where i am mm -hmm. yeah there's uh it's it's there's so much truth to it when you talk about a choice um and there's so many times that i have caught matter of fact just recently maybe uh, probably just three or four days ago i made some posts on instagram about something, well, somewhere I was at, somewhere I was doing, I don't remember what it was. And someone that I, I, I didn't know them, but they had heard me, they had seen me before, heard me speak, whatever it was, yeah. and they DM'd me and uh, just like dis ripped me to shreds of, of my post, um, to basically telling me how I was doing everything wrong and this, that, and the other. And the whole concept, the whole thing behind it is exactly what you're talking about. It's like, bro, you have no idea. Um, what it what I had to do and sacrifice and 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 make a choice on I'm not gonna do this I'm gonna do this instead yep. I'm not gonna do this I'm gonna do this instead uh, I'm I'm gonna take all this money and put it all back in this company and boy I hope it freaking pays off because if it doesn't I'm out of cash um, I don't know if you've ever been at this point most entrepreneurs that build from scratch have been there before where you're growing and you get to the point where it's like you mismanaged it somehow and you're like. I'm not gonna make payroll. I got people that I gotta cut a check to on Friday, and I'm I don't have it. I don't have it right now. Like, and I gotta go find it. And you don't know where to go. And and all those things that you know you go through as an entrepreneur, especially when you're like a startup, meaning you didn't go raise a bunch of capital, a VC money, etc. You came for money, but your dad didn't give you money in the sense of like yeah. this is all startup, right? At, at, a, at a minimum, my dad gave me the permission to be able to earn money. At one point he told me, don't become a doctor or an attorney mm -hmm. or an accountant, although I did accounting for a little bit, because the, the most you'll ever make is 600,000 a year. Mm. Think about what that does to a mentality of an 18 year old kid. Eight, I was like, I, sh I should be able to make more than, I should make more than 600,000 a year? Like at the time I would be happy to make 150. Yeah, yeah. Right? It's so true, man. Money is definitely a choice and you have to make choices. If you want it, there's choices that you are gonna have to make uh, that are very, very tough choices, and you're gonna have yes. to make those choices if you freaking want that money. Uh, and uh, uniquely enough, um, kind of all goes full circle back to a very, very beginning conversation, the two different sides of, of you know, uh, kind of in your example, being homeless on one side and a billion on the other side. When you have, when you make the choices and you get the money, that money then will provide you, um, um, give you the ability to, to choose other outcomes yeah. because you know you've made all those choices it then gives you the ability to choose other outcomes that the one side won't be able to choose what we talked about earlier right like yeah. they can't you can't just choose when you when you haven't made all the choices to have money you now don't have the freedom to choose to uh, go take a month off in july yeah. just because you want to to go travel 120 days in a year because you have the ability or to show to. up to your kids practice because you, your boss won't leave you out of work to you do can't that choose to do that yeah, i agree and because the choices were never made earlier so therefore, it never gave you the the birthing of making these uh, being able to have being able to have uh, be able to choose what you do with that time and energy now. Yeah, choices is a good word, man. And I think I think on top of my head, uh, I'm going through the wall right now. But I believe it's the only time someone's used that word. Have you? Did you look on the I wall? I did my research okay. before. Yeah. I right. had some backup ones that I won't share, but yeah, I did my research beforehand. Uh, actually, I do want you to share them with me, but don't take uh, we won't do it on the show. So if someone else uses them, but in my office, I don't, I don't know what they are for sure. Uh, this that's my favorite part of the show right there. Um, especially when guys or girls like you that, that spend time thinking about really what that what that is and why it means that. So, Ryan, I love having you on the show. Again, rocketlister.com, your website right now. I know you own a, um, a cabinetry business uh, yeah. that you have, another business, just on a personal level. If someone wanted to follow you on a personal level to go see what you do in life, et cetera, DM you, whatever it is, talk to you about your cabinetry, other business that you have, what would be the best uh, social media platform to go to. So I'm the most active on Facebook. Okay. Find me on Facebook. I do a lot of lives on there. I am getting a lot more active on Instagram. The okay. real Ryan Robeson is how to find me. And, and that, I respond really well through those platforms if you DM me. And the handles, we'll put it on here, but it's, uh, on Instagram, it's just the real Robson. Ryan Rob Robson. Uh, Ryan uh, Robson yeah. dot com, right? The real Ryan Robson dot com. That was my wife's not, not dot com, but uh, you handle. That was my wife's idea, so that's, my, that's my handle. Yeah. All right, so they can follow you over there, guys. Uh, for watching the Money Show, I hope you enjoyed watching the show. Make sure you guys follow Ryan. Stay tuned to Rocket Listers as it's coming to a city near you, especially if you're in Atlanta. It's right around the corner. We yeah. are right around the corner. Atlanta, Dallas, Houston. We're coming. They're coming for you, man. Hey, thanks for watching the Money Show.